I want to preach on to swerve, to swerve. You heard the old saints say when you were growing up, you better swerve so we miss that bump in the road. And some of you probably thought that was just country terminology. It's not. It's biblical. And I'm going to take you to where it's at here in just a moment. But that's what I'm preaching on today, to swerve. Uh, one more time, can we thank God for all that has already transpired today from the Sunday school classes. Thank God for education hour from 9 to 10 to everything that God is doing in children's church. Thank God for his goodness. Thank you, Jesus. First Timothy chapter 1, uh, verse number 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God our Savior, Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope. Unto Timothy, my own son in the faith, grace, mercy, peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine, neither give heed to fables, endless genealogies, which minister questions rather than godly edifying, which is in faith, so do. Verse four, stay off of Facebook. With, 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 with the messes that people want to get you into. That, that's all. That, that was concluding it right there. Um, now, <laughs> voice number five. Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and a faith unfeigned, from which some having swerved. Look at your neighbor and say, swerved is a word today. Tell them swerved is the word today. From which some having swerved have turned aside unto vain jangling, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. They, they, they just know enough to be dangerous, I often say. Go with me now. Just flip the pages about five more chapters and you'll end up in 2 Timothy and I want to go to verse number one. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, according to the promise of his life, which is in Christ Jesus. That's verse number one. Remember, I told you it was chapter number two. So I want to go in chapter number two. Sorry about that. It's about three, chapter one. Chapter two is what I want. Thou, therefore, thou, therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. You will find when Paul also wrote to Philemon, you will find another word in there that says fellow soldier. There's a lot of military communication, if you will, because we are in a spiritual battle. There's warfare all around us. People are getting free. People are getting delivered. God's side is winning. God's team's getting the victory. We may have some temporary battles. We may have some temporal messes. But ultimately, God's people's getting some victory. So endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. Tell your neighbor, a soldier. And if a man also strive for masteries, yet is he not crowned except he strive lawfully. The husbandman that laboreth must first be partaker of the fruits. Consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. I'm preaching for a few moments to swerve. And I'm also going to be preaching for a few moments out of 2 Timothy as well. That's chapter number 2. And 1 Timothy, it was chapter number 1. Father, we love you, we bless you, and thank you for the time that you've given us together. I pray that, God, you will stretch it, expand it somehow in the time frame that we have to make it possible to get your thoughts worked into the atmosphere through what you've dropped in my spirit through preaching. I pray, God, that you touch your people, encourage them, help them. Father, we welcome the Holy Ghost in the house. Your presence, Father God, we have to have. So, God, bless your people, all of them, every one of them, every one of them, God. Put your hand upon them, Father God, to those not living right, to those living good, to those righteously doing everything they can to be pleasing. Father, move on your people collectively, and we'll thank and praise you for it in Jesus' name. And let everybody say amen. And amen. And let the church say.
Amen. Let the church say amen. Praise God. Come on and clap your hands. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Glad to have my wife back with me in the tabernacle. Hallelujah. Thank God for her. And my daddy's over here as well. And thankful to, thankful to see all of our church family. Praise God. Everybody glad to be in the family of the Lord. And if that's not you, you still have time. Thank God. I want to preach for a few moments. My, my heart is full of emotion today, thinking about where we need to be and where we need to go. And having said that, there is a, um, there, there is a feeling of, uh, there's, I'm just anxious. I, I, just, I know God's up to some great things. I know he wants to do something incredible. And I, I, just, I want him to do it in two minutes. But he's telling me, slow down, slow down. Let this word that's so rich walk into people's lives and do what only the word of God can do. And so we're, we're going to trust God. First of all, we need to understand the dynamic of what's going on. I think this is really important. When you read the book of Timothy, you get the feeling over the course of reading it that Paul actually wrote to Timothy in two letters uh, in, in the first book and in the second book. And, and there are divisional places where if you study it enough, you will see transitions that start to happen. There's things that Paul is talking about and he's talking to, to Timothy. And when he speaks to him, you get the feel as you go through it that there's a dynamic that's being placed, a, a, a bit of pressure. There's some things that are going on and ultimately, by the time you get to the second book of Timothy, watch what happens. It's the last time we hear from Paul. It's the last time he writes and that's when he starts to tell Timothy, it, it's coming down. It's starting to happen. I, I, look, I've ran. Uh, I finished my course. There's laid up for me a crown. And he starts talking about that. that. That vernacular, that reading, that text means that Paul is literally in a jail in Rome. And he is writing and saying to him, I hope you get here before anything happens. But just in case. So... Get the urgency of why I said what I said a minute ago, because just as I'm real urgent to preach this today, because some of you, I won't get an opportunity to have you back here, and I pray I do in the name of Jesus. Perhaps there's a visitor here that might not get to come back, or there are people here that it might never be like this again. We know that's the case, but we also understand that we have a time and a moment to really get this, and I feel like Paul, as he's preaching to to Timothy and writing him a letter, not that I feel like it's our last time here, but you never know when the Lord could come back. And then the moment of an eye, we shall be changed. It'll happen that fast. So there's an urgency in my spirit to talk to you about what I'm going to talk about, but I want to make certain that we get there and that we get there in such a fashion that God would be pleased. So get the application of what I'm preaching and how it's urgent and get it when you look through 2 Timothy, this is it. This is the last time that we hear from Paul. So the purpose to write to Timothy is to encourage and instruct a young pastor and his ministerial work, to hasten him to come and see him in Rome and to bring him comfort. Timothy, I would be comforted if you could make it. I hope we get to see one another again. Second Timothy 4, 6, for I'm, ready, for I'm now ready to be offered. The time of my departure is at hand. I fought a good fight, Timothy. I finished my course, Brother Timothy. I kept the faith. Henceforth, there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them that also love his appearings. There's multiple crowns in the scripture. I preach a message on the five crowns. This is one of them. And when, when Paul is writing to Timothy to say, uh, this is what God's going to give me and to all. There's going to be other people that receive them as well. And this is, I believe, at the, the Bema. It's during the seven years of tribulation. It's when we are at the marriage supper of the Lamb. And there's also the Bema or the judgment seat of Christ. And this is where we will receive these crowns. Everybody say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Timothy was not robust. We can find this as you look through the books of Timothy that Paul wrote to him. Now, what does robust mean? Because preacher, you need to break this down. It means strong and healthy. Now, I'm not saying there's people that don't know what robust means. I think we all 
have a picture in our mind of what robust is. But now, if you want the real true definition of it, this is something that Paul was working with Timothy on, and I'll give you support in Scripture uh, because it simply means to be robust is strong and healthy. It means vigorous. And there are things, according to Timothy, 1 Timothy 5, 23, Timothy was just not robust, and Paul was writing to him to tell him, this is my last letter. This is my last opportunity. You've got to get this. He was a little timid. That's found in 1 Timothy 1, 6 and 7. He was never to be ashamed of his testimony and the work, and that's found in 2 Timothy 1, 8, also 2 and 15. Never be ashamed. Don't be ashamed of prison. Don't be ashamed of stripes, beatings. Do not be ashamed of your testimony. And this is what Paul was trying to tell Timothy. Don't forget about that. Last but not least, to regard himself as a soldier in the middle of a tough campaign. That's 2 Timothy 2 and verses 3 and 4. A soldier in a tough campaign. Remember when we read that? We read scripture that sounded like, and be not entangled again with the affairs of this world. We talked about that, and he talked about you got to be a good soldier. You're going to have to endure hardness as a good soldier. There's things you're going to have to go through. Saints, let me stop and just be real real pastoral to you. Let me tell you that you're going to go through hardships. You're going to go through difficulties. None of us in the building are exempt from them. I can look to my far left and all the way around as I pan, all the way to my far right. I can see people that have gone through hardships. I can see people that are going through hardships. And I can see people that have stood like a good soldier and said, I'm not going to get tangled up with the affairs of what's going on. I'm not going to let Facebook suck me in. I'm not going to let social media pull me out of my assignment as a soldier. I'm not going to let the criticism of the world mess up my mindset. I'm not going to let the critiquing of some Christian or religious people slow me bound from doing what God wants me to do. I'm going to go on and sweat a little bit and wipe my brow with my towel. I'm going to go on and get me a drink now and again. I'm going to keep preaching the word of God. I'm going to keep saying what I got to say. I'm going to keep talking in tongues. I'm going to let the gifts of the spirit move. I'm not, I'm going to be a good soldier. I'm not going to let any of that mess out there hold me back. I'm not being mean today, I'm not being facetious, but I feel like I am kind of a little bit borderline when I say this. I'm sick and tired of being made fun of because we get emotional. <laughs> I'm sick and tired of being made fun of because we shout a little bit around here. I, I, I know, there, I, I'm, I, I assure you, there are people that only watch to see who's gonna get in. I don't even go here that have no investment in this house and text and other family members and people. You see brother got in. You see so-and-so got in. Come on, everybody. Help me write. Can I just say what I got to say? I'm not going to let it affect me. I'm not going to let it push me around as if some bully by social media is going to snuff my shout out. He has been absolutely unequivocally way too good to me to shut up now. He's been too good for me to shut down now. He's been too good to me to not shout now. I can't help it when I think about where I would have been, could have been and should have been. All of a sudden out of nowhere, Jesus stepped in my mess and he saved me. He picked me up, put my feet on a firm foundation I can't help it every now and again I gotta thank him every once in a while I got to praise him because he's been real good now let me preach on what I got to preach on because I'm preaching on to swerve and as we found out in the word of God in 1 Timothy chapter number one, swerve in the scripture is to deviate from, to miss the mark. And you know what sin means? Sin means to miss the mark. And so it is when you begin to swerve, it is when you start to go around stuff. It's when you start to swerve in the faith. Bible goes on to say in that same verse about jangling, which is vain talking, or empty talk. It means there are things that are being said that are not necessary to say. Some things are better off left alone. It wasn't long after my tenure as a pastor, 
I started figuring out after a while it's a good thing to just let the dog lie there and sleep. Sometimes it's a good thing not to get the broom handle and poke a skunk that's underneath your porch. Some things you are better off to leave them laying right there. There's some giants you don't need to fight. I remind you that Goliath had four brothers, but only one of them was running their mouth. Only one of them needed taken care of that day. There are always going to be giants in your life, but there is a time, there is an opportunity that will present itself to you when it's time that you've got to confront some things. You better make sure you get down by the brook. Kneel down and find your five smooth stones in case the same day you're dealing with Goliath, you might have to deal with his brothers, but you just better have some reinforcement. I just don't have one passage of scripture. I got all kind of Bible that gives me victory and that gives me comfort and that gives me peace and that gives me hope while I'm in the boat and the storm is raging come on and tell your neighbor there's some things you just can't go around you got to go through I have made it policy and or protocol in my life not to always answer my critics not to always clap back at people that constantly clap at us and I talk to pastors about this all the time and young ministers about this often that you can't always pay attention to what everybody has to say. Hallelujah. I really don't think eagles ever get sidetracked by what chickens have to say about them. <laughs> Listen, I want you to understand my humble heart. I don't mean to say I'm somebody. I don't mean to say I'm an eagle, but you get the point that you are who God called you to be and stop letting everybody pull you down to their level. Stop letting everybody mess with you. I'm talking to some eagles today. I'm not talking about me. I'm telling you that you can't always pay attention to what the critics have to say. You just stay in your lane and do what God called you to do. You just keep on running if you run. Keep on shouting if you shout. Keep on clapping if you clap. Keep on praising if you praise. Keep on worshiping if you do, but stay away from the swerve. Come on, push a couple people while you're standing and say, stay away, stay away from the swerve. Stay away from the vain talking. Stay away from the empty talk. Stay away from conceit, arrogance. Stay, humi stay humble. Walk in humility. Stay like Jesus and have a, a servant's heart and mind and mouth all the time. Be exactly where he wants you to do. And in due time, he will exalt you. But it's when you humble yourself, not lift yourself up. I don't want to have to tell anybody that I think I'm a good preacher. I don't want to tell anybody that I think I'm a good singer. And I'm being humble right now, saying to God, listen to me. Your gift will make room for itself. You don't have to remind yourself or anybody else how good you are. You just need to keep reminding everybody around you how good God is. How wonderful he is. How if you'll just let him put his hand on you and use you, he'll work it all out for you. Don't worry about it. Let God have it. Let God take care of it. You just keep winning souls. You just keep going after what the enemy thought he was going to take to steal and kill and destroy. You stay on the battlefield. You stay out there in the field. I know you're going to dodge some bullets. I know you got ammo flying over your head. I know you got mess going on around you, but don't get tangled up. Paul told Timothy, thank you, saints. Paul told Timothy, he said, be strong in the grace. And in this particular passage, that means which affords joy, pleasure, delight, sweetness, charm, loveliness, grace of speech. Be careful how you say what you say. Be careful. As the Bible says, let another man's lips praise thee. <laughs> There's some smoke coming up the place and it's being pushed out of here because we're getting some freedom in this house. Woo! Some freedom in the house. Your conversation needs to afford some joy. It should be pleasurable. It should be delightful. 
You should have some sweetness because you never know when you have to go back and eat your words. And it's always better if they were sweet to begin with. That's why you make your words like honey. Because if you ever have to go back and eat it, honey, it'll be sweet like honey, baby. Amen. I'm talking to all y'all right there. You're going to have to endure hardness. The second Timothy two and three, thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. I am a soldier and the army of the Lord. I'm a soldier. Hallelujah. I'm a soldier. Everywhere you go, you remember you're a soldier. You're not some pushover. You're a soldier. You're not some jelly back. You're a soldier. God designed you to be a soldier. He drafted you in the army of the Lord. He drafted you when you felt conviction and the pull and the tug from heaven. Sitting in a natural seat being tugged from a heavenly being. Hallelujah. Jehovah God sent his son that his son could live and bleed and die to be the propitiation. To be the sacrifice for our sin because blood had to be shed. And here we are and we feel the pull from heaven. And the Lord starts working with us. And it's the Holy Ghost that brings enough comfort to know I need God in my life and you find yourself at an altar and you join in the army of the Lord when you submit yourself to the Lord hallelujah Jesus and I'm telling you when you sign up you're going to have to understand when you get saved you're going to have to get thick skin you're going to have to get some tough skin you're going to have to have some tenacity that when they laugh at you and talk about you at least they're making fun of you because you're doing something not sitting in church asleep and boy out of your mind you all might as well shout now <laughs> Bible says in 2 Timothy 4 5 but watch thou in all things endure afflictions do the work of an evangelist make full proof of thy ministry that that word endure scripturally speaking it means to undergo hardship Saints of God, we're going to have some hardships. Moses had to endure trying to get all those precious people out of Egypt. Joseph had to endure those that were against him, his own family members. Jacob had to endure through his difficulty with deception. The woman with the issue of blood had to press and endure. Jairus had a daughter dead and came and endured grief to worship. Jesus endured the cross, despised the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the Father. James 5 and verse 11. Y'all can jump in and help me anytime you want to behold we count them happy which endure we count them happy which endure some of you that were dragging your knuckles when you got out of the car and had to pull your lip up and lift up your chin we count you happy because you didn't stay home roll over and say I can't do it I count you happy because you drugged your knuckles picked up your lip and said I'm going in to the house of God I, I might be tired I might be weary but I'm going on and happy are you when you endure Happy are you when you keep on smiling. Happy are you when you keep on shouting. Happy are you when you keep on preaching. Happy are you when you keep on singing. Happy are you when you keep on waving. Happy are you when you keep on hollering. Hallelujah, Jesus. Happy, happy, happy. Get all my happy people that are enduring right now. What all my happy people that are enduring stand up and push a few other happy people and say, good for you. Good for you that you never gave up and you never gave in and you ain't quit. <laughs> Behold, we count them happy which endure. You have heard of the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. Woo! Can I keep preaching? <laughs> 2 Timothy 2 and 4. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. Your mind is the battlefield. While I'm preaching right now, my heart is heavy over things that I know I've got to face when I leave here. My heart is heavy over things that I know people are battling through. Saints of God, y'all need to pray for me. 
because I'm praying for people that I know are hurting right now and are struggling right now. And the only sense enough I have at this moment when you go through difficulties with your friends and your loved ones that are going through battles is to know this, that your mind is the battlefield. So God, thank you for boldness and strength to preach right now. So many times you will hear people say, I was thinking. In other words, their mind was at work. There was a battle going on when they're thinking about something. They're trying to work it out. They're trying to fathom. They're trying to ascertain they can't wrap their mind around it because the mind is the battlefield. Your heart has been saved, but your mind can be carnal. And that carnal mind is death. But I'm telling you, when you get transformed by the renewing of your mind and you renew the spirit of your mind, something begins to happen that makes your critics all fall by the wayside. Something begins to happen that all the bad news you carried into the pulpit gets thrown over the side of the boat because you know that God is going to work it out for if God be for me who can be against me no height nor depth nor angels nor principalities nor things present nor things to come shall be able to separate me from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord My God, I feel the Holy Ghost in the house. Woo! I feel God in here. While I'm preaching, woo! while I'm preaching, and while you're sitting there, and while you're out there, while I'm preaching, the enemy is lurking on our families. And the enemy's trying to talk us out of the goodness of God. And the enemy's trying to tell us, you're never coming out of this. This tunnel gets too narrow. There is no way he gonna work it out. But I've watched him move too many times. When I think about Noah that had to build a boat and the fountains of the deep opened up and the clouds rolled in. And I think about the goodness of the Lord that the cloud never showed up and the deep wasn't broken up until the boat was built. I dare you to tell your neighbor even if trials and tribulation is coming your way you better build yourself a boat you better jump on in and God shut the door that means God's going to shut you in and can't nobody unlock it and pull you out We're in a war. We're in a war. There's an enemy that's after the credibility of our church. There's an enemy that's after the credibility of leadership. There's an enemy that's after my life and after your life. But we're not going to rejoice that, we are, that the spirits are subject unto us. We're not going to rejoice because the spirit is subject unto us. But we are going to rejoice that our names are written in the book of life. You know what that name that you know what that means when your name is written in the book of life? For God I live and for God I die. That I know at the end of the day that God, I, I just, I just need, I just need about two people that I'm preaching to just step out in the aisle and run or walk and just say, Pastor, you boy, boy you are preaching to me. I'm, I'm telling you are preaching to me right now. Shout yeah! Woo! Woo! Can I keep on preaching? Can I keep on preaching? Can I keep on preaching? The enemy, the enemy's trying to mess with minds. The enemy's trying to mess with people. When he can't you, get you, he'll attack your children. 
when he can't uh, get you, he'll attack your health. There is an enemy that is on the loose and he's doing everything he can. He will try to split and divide and isolate and tear apart the body of Christ. That's what he's doing to your body. That's what he wants to do to the church body. I come by to tell you we are in a battle. We are in a battle. No wonder God you wouldn't let me preach this last Sunday. This was meant for today. We are in a battle. We are in a battle. We are in a battle. We are in a battle, and I'm telling you, you got your marching orders. You just keep on marching. Why, pastor, should I keep on marching? Because we already know the outcome of the battle. This battle is actually fixed. This battle is already set up. Can I just, can I just say how my mind kind of relates things? It's kind of like the WWE. The thing's already set up. And you, you, oh, y'all, it ain't helping me now. It, it's already, God's already pulled the card and said, I'm going to let you fight, but I already know who wins. I already know who gets the victory. I wish I had some brothers that might get out and just say, come on, preacher, and preach on. Where's the man? Run up here. Let's give God a shout of praise. All right, where's my soldiers at? Where's my soldiers at? Run up here real quick, all the soldiers. Run up here and high five a couple of soldiers and tell them we're in the battle. We're in the army, but we already won. Come on, come on. I'm a soldier in the army of the Lord. I'm a soldier in the army. I'm a soldier in the army of the Lord. I'm a soldier in the army. Of the Lord. This whole thing's a setup. This whole thing's a setup. He already gave you the victory. I don't know why we're walking around like we're defeated when he already gave you the victory. He already gave you the joy. He already gave you the peace. If you don't have it, there's only one conclusion to who's got it. And you better step yourself back and open up the hands of that enemy and say, give me my stuff back now. 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 Whoa. Come on. Come on. Yes, 
Romans. Romans chapter 8 and verse 17. If children, then heirs. Heirs of God, join heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him. Don't leave me there, preacher. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be glorified together. For I reckon. That's an accounting term. It means to balance your, your, your bank statements, your checkbook. For I reckon. I've sat down and counted the cost. And I think I realize now that the suffering of this present time are not worthy. To be compared to the glory. Y'all mind if I read that again? For I reckon for I sat down and I thought this thing through. And I reckon the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. All the mess that you have to go through, all the letdowns and the hardships and the, the wrestling. I want you to understand one day that you're going to look back and say, none of this is even worthy. None of it's even worth. Listen, I can show you some good sized trials that I can look back over trials and say, I have a deep respect for trials. I can show you some scars that, that I have to wear. I can show you the places in my life where I got hurt so bad, I thought. I have a deep respect for stuff I've been through and stuff you've been through. But do you know there's going to be a day that when you trade it, you're going to look back and say, none of that is even worthy. <laughs> to the glory that will be revealed in us. None of it. So some of you right now that are sitting in this service and you've been gritting your teeth, You've been gripping that pew and you've been holding on to the edge of your seat. I want to tell you something. The thing you're going through right now isn't even worthy to pop up in your mind and put itself next to what God is going to do because you endured chastening and we call you happy because of it. Now you've gone through that and now you can look back over it and say it's not worthy to be compared to where I am now. The glory is so heavy and so weighty that some of you feel the weight of depression or the weight of discouragement or the weight of the pain or the weight of the hurt or the weight of the isolation or the weight of the criticism. But let me tell you something. Add it all up. Go ahead. Add it all up. Add all your hurts up. All your pain up. Your blood pressure's rising. Your heart rate is doing something different. Anxiety and breathing is tough because you think about all the stuff you've been through. And yeah, you probably should have quit if you looked at it from the flesh. But now I dare you to stack it all up and compare it to what God's getting ready to do in your life. Hallelujah. Loretta, I knew where you were at when you came to our church. I knew where you lived at when you came to our church. I knew it. I knew it. I knew the struggle you were in when you drove up here in that maroon Ford Windstar. But look at what God has done for you now. <laughs> the glory. The glory, the glory, the glory. What God is getting ready. I can say that to 500 people in here. 
and still leave a bunch out. Compare it. Compare it. All the stuff I got to go through is not worthy. One day the glory is going to hit you so good you're going to look back and go, what, what trial? Well, don't you? Re- oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember that. But, but, but where am I now? Hallelujah. Ah, listen to me, devil. Here's what we're going to do. You are-